This is a class on facilitating support groups. What does it mean to facilitate a support group? It means you're the leader of the support group, but that doesn't mean you just come and give them a bunch of lectures. It means that you are there to sort of keep the support group on track and to try and work with it so that people can help each other. What are we talking about when we're talking about a support group? Support groups are simply a focused group of people that try to help each other deal with a particular problem. And so your job as a facilitator is to help that actually occur and help that actually happen. But first the question is, do we need support groups? Why would even want to be a facilitator of a support group at all? Let's just look at a few statistics in our society. We all know that probably over half of marriages break up, right? Uh, half of those, one statistic says, that are married have an affair during their marriage. Of marriages, only about 25% are considered to be happy. One third of people live in single family homes. Millions of teenagers get pregnant every year. One third of women have been sexually abused and one sixth have suffered incest. Domestic violence occurs in 25% of our homes and at least once in two thirds of all marriages. One out of 10 people have problems with drinking or drugs. Five to 10 million Americans are addicted to prescription drugs. Suicide for those between ages 15 and 19 has almost tripled since 1960. 18% suffer from major depressive episodes. Baby boomers are almost 10 times more likely to be depressed. 75% have thoughts of suicide and 10 to 15% have attempted it. So do we have any problems here that maybe support groups could help? The number of support groups has quadrupled in the last 10 years. Over 15 million Americans go to support groups right now, and they expect in the next few years it might reach 60 million. 40 to 80 million Americans are compulsive eaters. 5 to 15% die as a result. $20 million is spent every year on diets. You think maybe we could have a support group concerning that? 60 million Americans are sexually abused by age 18, one fourth of the population. 12 million Americans are compulsive gamblers. 50 million people are affected. One half to one third are codependent. That means they have messed up relationships. 80% of men do not have a best friend. Most people do not even know the name of their neighbors. Social organizations are becoming larger, so you don't get the, you know, the personal help like through doctors and so on that you used to get in your society. In fact, most doctors, what do you have to do if you see them? Tell them all about your history because they have no clue and they're only going to see you for 15 minutes anyway. Most people feel just like expendable numbers. And how much family disintegration do we have? How many problems do we have? Tons. We have all these particular needs that are out there, and how are all these needs going to get met? That's the real question. You know, the most effective ways to meet these needs is through support groups. Why? Because in a support group, one facilitator can help 10 or 20 people in one or two hours, rather than if I meet with you individually as an individual counselor, I can help one person in that same time frame, right? Another reason is there are no requirements and no state laws or anything to be a facilitator of a support group. Support groups are considered to be primarily just a bunch of people that get together who are sharing their experiences and the things that work for them with other people. They're called self-help groups. Another good thing about that, that means that they don't have the same level of liability, do they? 
Because you're not claiming you know anything, you just claim you're interested in this particular subject. But even if you don't know a whole lot, can you still help other people? An interesting piece of research said that looking at all the different types of counseling that there are, if you have three factors, people get help. The first factor is if you allow them to talk. Second factor is if you give unconditional positive regard, if you care for the people and don't reject them. And the third one is if you can give some sort of an explanation, some sort of an idea of what to do about it. Well, can anyone do that? Pretty much yes, and that means anyone can help anyone if you just get together, talk about it, do it, and work it through. There are a lot of different kinds of support groups. We'll be talking more about that later. But see, there are all these particular needs that we can meet through those support groups. Now, how about in the church? One of the advantages of churches are, because support groups have been around for a long time, like AA, where do a lot of them meet? Church. In churches, because they get free facilities, right? Another advantage of that is, because of that, and AA is tends to be spiritual, people coming to churches and support groups expect spiritual answers. And so this isn't like you're doing something not appropriate. This fits perfectly into our society. If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol or codependence or other things like that, anger management, where do most people get their help? Support groups. So if you have those support groups in your church, they're going to come there and they're going to expect it to be spiritual. And guess what you can do? You can lead them to the Lord, you can help them, you can evangelize them, you can give them spiritual direction. It's all going to be appropriate, all feel and be accepted, isn't it? So it fits into our society very easily. How about the cost? Yeah, almost negligible. You know, you might take an offering to the church to pay for the lights or something. But you, it's that kind of an easy thing. And you can address any issue you want to. The other thing about support groups is you can address any issue that the Lord seems to lead you to, right? And you can actually change from one issue to another issue to another issue with no problem. So this is a huge tool that's available that's very much accepted in our society where you can help a lot of people very rapidly. Another big advantage, since it isn't costing you anything, you can offer the support groups for free, can't you? So that means if you're dealing with an area of town or some place where people are pretty much impoverished, this is something you can provide to draw people into your church. And then when you get to know them, you can minister to them. Another good thing about support groups is they automatically lead into developing a full counseling ministry in your church. Because you draw these people in, right? And when they're in the group and you're leading the group, what's going to eventually happen? People in the group are going to say, could I talk to you by myself? I've got this particular issue. Don't have enough time in the group to talk about it. But could we bring this up? So it leads automatically into developing a lay counseling ministry, developing a all sorts of different ministries in different areas. Another thing that's good about support groups is they're like amoebas. What's good about amoebas? They divide. So you start out with one general type of support group. And as you're doing that, people in the group, what are they learning? To help themselves, but also to learn how to lead groups. So when that group grows and they invite all their friends and the group gets too large, you say, hey, why don't, why don't we split the group? You take that half, I'll take this half. Another thing we've done if they get too large is we'll go and do the initial uh, information part of it and then we'll split it up and we'll take different people in the group and have them each have their smaller group of like four or five people or something in different areas of the room so they get more individual attention. So this thing sort of just flows. It sort of has its own momentum and it can sort of take off and a lot can happen. How big can the use of groups be? How many of you heard of Dr. Cho's church in Korea? Do you know how it grew that large? I think five or ten million? 
through support groups. They call them care groups. In their society, yeah, more than working on individual things like is in our society, in their society, uh, getting together and doing things socially in small groups was what was missing. And he was able to recruit the ladies because the men were all out working to lead all these care groups. And they built all these care groups and house churches and they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied until they have the largest church in the entire world. And a lot of other churches here in America are based on ministries like this. Our own experience is though that care groups in our society don't seem to be as effective as support groups. Why? Because a lot of people are so busy, they just don't need it. Social interaction isn't enough to get them to come consistently. But if they have a particular focus of their life, Let's just say they're addicted to cocaine and it's destroying their life. Do you think they might be motivated enough to come? Or they have a sexual addiction, or they have been abused, or their life is in total chaos, or they... See, all these different areas, whatever you focus on, just draws people in. And you can... What we did here is we started out with one week group, we called it Codependency and Addiction. We got some people, helped them, then we broke it between, split it between addictions and codependency. Then we split addictions between drug and alcohol addiction and sexual addiction. And we just kept building those churches, those, sorry, building those support groups more and more. And it's need-based, whatever we need. And so our groups here change based on the needs of the people. Some of them will fade out, other ones will be added. But we just continue to work that particular way. Uh, we found an extremely effective way to help a lot of people. Another thing that's really good here that we'll mention later is that in Kansas, you have the Self-Help Network. It's a network that lists all the support groups in Kansas. So when people call, you can list yourself for that, you can advertise in free places, and people will know about you. If they're looking for, say, a Cody Fancy support group, and they go to the Self-Help Network, we're listed there with all the rest of them. So we have people that just show up out of the blue from time to time, because they had the need, and they found out we had a group, so they came to meet that particular need. But what's the Bible basis of groups? We don't want to do something that's not in the Bible, do we? I'm going to suggest that that was Jesus' method. Think about Jesus a little bit, and think about how God operated in the Bible. Did he work, and did he just go out and individually work with individual people? What were his groups? The first was a group of 12, right? Called his disciples. And then there was a group of 70, wasn't there? See how they're multiplying? And then there was a group of 120. And what is the church really? It's a family, it's a group, right? In fact, in our church, we've now multiplied beyond support groups. We have a leadership group. We have all sorts of other different types of groups. A group for new Christians. Different groups around the church, all on the same night, that minister to all sorts of very different needs. And it's very effective that way. How did it work in the long run? Through what Jesus did of discipling people and working people through these groups, in the first century, the world was evangelized. See, all of these groups can be used for evangelism. One of the rules we have here is everything we do ties into evangelism in some way, shape, or form because we believe the answer to everybody and every answer to every question is Jesus. And if you really get a hold of Jesus in an experiential, real way, it's going to transform the lives of people and they're going to make heaven their home. Which is the greatest victory of anything we can think about. See, what did he do? First he taught his disciples, didn't he? Then he had them in a group, and they worked together. And then, do you notice what he did? He split them up, and he sent them out two by two, didn't he? And then they came back, and they keep building these groups. What was the early church like? House churches little groups all over the place. They almost didn't go to work. 
There were so much going out and they went teaching and from place to place, helping people, bringing them in, helping them. See, if you think about a house church, it's just a big support group, right? Or a care group, it's just a big support group. And what did they do? Think about Jesus. Let's get the picture of Jesus sitting down with his disciples. What did he do? They talked about stuff, didn't they? And issues that came up, they faced and they talked and they shared. And he gave them wisdom on different things. He gave them principles on different things. Sometimes he taught. And sometimes he just listened and showed them different things. And sometimes he gave them skills. Sometimes he set them out to do things. It's the same thing in support groups. What we usually do in our support groups here is that we, in our support groups, we never have a group that is just a group. It always has a book. It always has something that's being taught in that group. So we have the teaching of Jesus, do you see what I'm saying? Plus the interaction with the people. And we mesh those two. Because you can get so much the group can turn in on itself if all we're doing is talking about and all we're doing is writing. Right? Now we need answers too. So we merge the answers with the fellowship and the caring. That's why they're called care groups sometimes. But support groups have both. has the teaching and the answers to the questions. Most of our groups here are actually led by qualified counselors. But that doesn't change anything. We're going to find later that we also can have what we call therapy groups. And that means you have to have a qualified person. That's more direct, that's more directed than we talk about facilitating a support group and that kind of thing. So let's look at it again in the church and let's just see the forerunner of a Christian ministry in the church. First thing I said is there's not much liability. I never heard of a support group being sued. Okay? So that makes it good for most churches, right? Normally, they're led by somebody who's just a lay person in the church. It doesn't have to be a pastor. It can be anybody that has a care for that particular thing. The rule in our church is you give us two leaders and five interested people and start another support group. That's all we need. And we'll see how it goes. And we'll work on that. It uses available resources the best you possibly can use it. How many support groups could we have in this complex of buildings that we have here today? Every classroom, we could have a support group, couldn't we? In fact, we could even have two or three support groups in each classroom, possibly, if we could keep the noise down enough. So the unlimited resources that you have here, minimum training required. Only takes one course like this to get all the pieces that you need to become an effective support group leader and go out and do it. That's simple, that's straightforward. It's easily accepted in churches. Even churches that won't accept counseling and feel like, you know, we're going to bring in psychobabble and all this kind of stuff, well, they will accept a group like we're going to do here today in experiencing God. And we're going to deal with those issues and so on because it fits right in with what the church is all about, doesn't it? Easy accepted by the community. You stick under your sign of your church uh, drug alcohol support group here tonight. So people in the community might just stop by. Uh, easily focused on the needs of people. As you're doing the support group, you can take it any direction you want to based on what those particular needs are and what those people need right now. Materials available on almost all topics. Today we have good workbooks, many of them formatted for support groups of 12 weeks with lessons in between to do at home, and give you all the material you need, Bible verses and everything, and almost every topic that exists. So therefore, even if you don't know your topic that much, all you have to do is stay once, one meeting ahead of the rest of the group, right? <laughs> and you can learn as you go. I'm going to suggest to you, you're going to learn more by leading a group than the members of the group are going to learn. Because you're going to be then dealing with it and having to wrestle with the different issues and so on and so forth. It provides a very acceptable form for evangelism. We've had Muslims come to our groups and get saved. We've had people from all different backgrounds. We've had atheists call and say, can I come? I say, sure. We've got no problem. 
a new tenant. Christian counseling, as I said, is a natural outgrowth of the support groups. So basically doing that support groups, pretty soon you're going to have counseling. And pretty soon you're going to have a license of professional counseling. And soon you're going to have uh, therapy groups and other things. But you can draw other people in. Because we have that, we're on the list of the courts for domestic violence, for drug and alcohol, for DUIs, for all of those kind of things. Those people come, we provide more services than the average support group, but then we have them also attend our support groups to get help. So the whole thing integrates together, and there's really almost no limit to what you can do with this particular type of a ministry in a church. If we don't have support groups, how do these needs get met? See, there are needs. They're going to get met, aren't they? No matter what. Well, what's the most famous secular support group? The bar. The bar. You got it. That's right. Why do people go to a bar? How many of you have seen Cheers? If you watched, if you watched the series Cheers, what was it? All it was was this big support group well, they all talked, they all interacted, and they got drunk on the side. Well, there are needs, and these needs are going to be met somewhere or another. What's another huge support group? Gangs. Gangs are a very powerful support group, aren't they? Because you have these needy kids who need a family, who need some place that they can integrate. So you need support groups in your team ministry. Need support groups in your Sunday school. Because there are a lot of kids out there that don't have fathers. There are a lot of people out there that don't have the resources to meet these needs. And if you don't meet them, the devil's going to. And the outcome, for some reason, I think that maybe our support groups have a more positive outcome than the gangs. What do you think? I think that that might uh, help just a little bit there. That they're filling the gaps. Groups are the most effective way to train leaders. So I'm going to be doing in this particular way. I'm going to train all of you to be support group leaders. And I can do that a whole lot more effectively doing it in a group. And of course you need experience. It isn't good enough for me to just give you this lecture. We're going to have to get together after this lecture and start experiencing what support groups are really like and how we really are going to meet this and how we're going to really do this. We all desperately need groups. We need people. In our society, that's a real problem, isn't it? There are all sorts of studies, I'm not sure if you heard of some of the studies that were done, say with uh, baby monkeys, and they just gave them wire mothers and how that didn't function. Because there's something about inside us. We need love. We need that unconditional acceptance, don't we? We need people to be there for us. We need to count. We just can't be a number. And that's what the support group really fits into. That's what really helps. An interesting, uh, it wasn't a study, it was accidental. In Korea, there were these two orphanages. And they didn't know what was wrong. But in the one orphanage, all the babies were doing great. In the other orphanage, they were failing to thrive and die. And they really didn't have any clue, because it wasn't, you know, the facilities were basically the same, everything was basically the same, they thought. And then they transferred one nurse from this facility to that facility. And all of a sudden, all these babies started thriving, and all these babies started dying. Guess what was happening? That's right. She was loving them, she was picking them up, she was spending time for them. And one of our support groups, just to give you an idea, it's been over 10 years now, this particular lady came to one of our support groups here. And she then became the leader of that support group. She's been leading it for 10 years. And she just loves on people. It's so interesting because you'll hear people come by and you'll hear, Wow, you're here! The person hasn't been there for three years. But there's that stability, there's that loving people, that caring for people. And of course, they work through them the different codependency books and so on and so forth. And many, many people have said, that's my family. That's my group. That's where I go. That's where I get my support. That's where I get my help. 
and there's such a need in our society for this particular thing. See, our rule is find the need and then we can take that need to lead them to Jesus and get them the real answers to their life and see their life get turned around. So there's so many people that can be helped, so many things that can just change everything in a person's life through this mechanism that we call small groups or support groups. What we're going to be doing here is that you have a book called Experiencing God. And we're going to ask that you start going through that particular book and work at it at home. And it's set up so each session has five lessons at home that you go through. And then after the lecture, we're going to get together as a support group here and we're going to talk about the issues in that book and we're going to try to help you experience God to a greater level than you've ever experienced God before. That's right. Lord, we thank you that you provide mechanisms and ways and you've demonstrated them to us, Lord God, of how we can help many, many other people and how we can be like your disciples and go out and reach people and see them delivered and then help them become all that you want them to be. And we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, I'm Troy Weiner and I'm going to be the leader of this group for today. And I'm really glad that you're all here. And in this group, we're going to be talking about the subject of experiencing God. Now, you might not be familiar with support groups. But basically, we're just all here to help each other. We're just all here to share. I'd like you, if possible, to try to always just share from yourself. It was I, and this is what happened to me. We don't want to get into trying to give advice or fix each other. What you get out of this group is totally up to you. If you don't want to talk or bring something up, that is perfectly fine. We just want you to be you, and we want to get to know you. And we want to be able to support you and to help you. I want you to understand that everything in this group is confidential. That means whatever goes on this group stays in this room. It doesn't go outside. You don't take to anyone else. Now, what would be the exceptions of that? The only exceptions would be if you share with us something that's required to be reported. That you are homicidal and you're going to kill somebody. And that you are suicidal and you're going to kill yourself or you are abusing uh, your, uh, your children or elders, something like that. But everything else will kept completely confidential of what goes on in this particular group, which means you're allowed to be you. Uh, as the leader, my job is to just uh, keep things going and to keep things focused on the group. And what that means is there might be some time when I have to uh, ask you to uh, stop talking so somebody else has a chance to talk if you have to be in that uh, monopolizing the group. Because, as a general rule, unless there's something real critical issue, we'll make exceptions, uh, everybody should have an equal chance to talk, an equal time to talk. And so we'll, I'll try to facilitate that. That's my job, is to facilitate you guys talking. And if I sit here and do all the talking, I am not being a good leader. Am I? <laughs> In fact, my job is to try to get you guys all talking so much, and we're going to see when we talk about the, uh, the different uh, phases of groups, and when we get to the working phase, I might not have to say anything or do very little because you're going to come already prepared, already to talk. And we're asking, since we're going through the Experiencing God workbook here, is that you do your own study, you get a hold of God, you learn, and you come up with questions or things you want to share or things that you think God wants you to share in this particular group and to help other people here. And we're just going to see what God does. That's what groups like this are all about. So the way I'd like to sort of start today is allow each of us to share something about their experiences with God at this particular point. Do you understand this is not a competition of where you are in experiencing God. This is a reality of trying to help you get connected to learn from other people that maybe you learn some other things or know how to do things in connecting with God to help you connect and have a real experience with God and to grow in God yourself. And so we're sharing. Some people in this group may be almost just babes in Christ, 
Others might have many, many years of experience. And that's all okay. Because the only reason we're here is for us. The reason I'm here is for me. i got to learn things. I need to get a hold of things. Just like each one of you. And it's just a very open type of thing. So who would like to start and give to share a little bit? We're only going to have about like uh, five minutes each or something like that at the most, probably to be able to do this. So we can't get your entire life story started, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, we would like to know more about your experience, if you had a, about like your testimony or a very experience or what you feel you are from God. And we'd like to give everybody a chance to share. And it's okay to ask questions. Or to, if they say something that you can bounce off to, from, great. Then just, let's we'll see how long it goes. Who would like to start? Okay. I want to, and as we start, let's do something. Right now, since we don't really know each other, uh, I'd like everyone to give, at least for the first session or two, to give your name. And say, my name is such and such. And then go from there. So, and... In this group, we'd like everyone to try and learn each other's names eventually, okay? Because that would probably all help. If you're doing a support group, one of the good things you can do sometimes if you're a larger group than this is you can get name tags and put name tags on people for the first few sessions before they uh, get to know the other people. Go ahead. Uh, one of the main reasons that I'm in now enrolled in the Bible College and want to uh, learn as, as much as I can on the, on, the, on the biblical base. So your goal is more to try and allow you, God to function more through you? Absolutely. Is that Absolutely. Of course, one thing we can all say, say what is your goal, you know, they say it's a good idea, say what is your goal, and why are you here yes. in this particular class? That can be useful also. Yes, my, that, and that's right. My goal is to allow God to function still and to get me out of the way. Amen. Because I've hit enough of the concrete walls. Okay. So, How about somebody else? Well, I've been in ministry virtually all my life. I was raised in the church. I uh, preached my first revival away from my home by myself at age 13. Traveled on the bus to the place. <coughs> Traveled to Galveston, Texas and held a revival in the in, in Galveston, Texas at age 13. Had a tremendous time doing it. And I guess I kind of fell into this uh, place where I felt like that I was very comfortable doing what I was doing. I uh, pastored several churches and I've been pastoring a church in, in Derby for almost nine years. And, and I was very comfortable doing that. I felt like I was doing a lot of evangelism and things, but I wasn't doing, I was doing it. And the experience that I have with God is that God is, has kind of pulled me down out of the nest and said, no, you're not supposed to be just sitting. You're supposed to be doing some other things that I've got planned for your life. And as a result of that, I've gotten in know uh, Dr. Troy and, and uh, we've been talking a lot and had him come to the church and I didn't know when I asked you to come to the church that I was going to end up leaving that church to start doing some other things but uh, it, it's been a situation where I knew that God still had things that he wanted me to experience and to be a part of but I just didn't know how to get there from where I was at. And uh, I've had a lot of people say that I was crazy because of the steps that I've taken, but I feel like that I'm hearing God clearly. And um, I feel like that God's going to do some things that He couldn't do, not necessarily because of where I was at, but the mental state that I was in. And, uh, uh, because those people are good people. In fact, the number of the people that are here in this class I met while I was there, but uh, there's still some things that God's teaching me that I don't know all about. And so I'm just uh, trying to learn what He's trying to teach me 
go to the next step. What I'm hearing now is also you've got a lot of experience and being able to share a lot of things with us. From the past, you've got a lot of years of experience in <laughs> God. And, and it doesn't have to be right stuff. It can also be all wrong stuff, too. Yeah. A lot of us learn right. better from the things that we have messed up. Then, see, a lot of things we can experience. I can tell you a lot. I may end up sharing a lot of my mess ups. And a lot of my experiences that didn't come out so good, or how I realized later what was really going on. But that's all part of what we're doing in a support group. And so we want, in fact, it's best in a support group that we have a mixture of a lot of different people at different levels and different places because there's so many things we can share that, uh, you know, good, bad, and ugly. Sometimes, yeah, I got this great glorious thing, but man, I didn't ever saw that. And all these things, that's part of a good, viable support group. Who's next? I'll go next. Okay. My name's Loretta. And I'm the director of the Center for the Lord the better part of my life. And from a very young child, I realized that I had a calling on my life. And uh, my entire life has been geared in my thoughts and in my heart to serving God in whatever capacity that, um, that he would call me to. However, for whatever reason, I have always felt extremely inadequate. And it's only in the last few years, basically, since I've been attending these classes and, and um, I'm in a really good church and so on and so forth, that I've come to realize that, yes, God does want me to be a servant, but I'm not the one doing it. It's, I'm, my testimony is so much like Bruce's. You know, it's not me doing it, it's God doing it. And see, and I, I, I have trouble with that because... I wanted so much to be God's servant, wanted so much to be in his ministry, and I didn't care what it was. I didn't care if it was cleaning toilets, or whether it was behind the pulpit, or whether it was going to Africa, or India, or anywhere else. I didn't care. Just God used me. That was my heart's cry. God used me. However, whenever, you know, whatever you want to do. But it's taken a long time of walking in faith to realize that yes, I am God's servant. I am just where he wants me to be, but it's him doing it. And I have to bring myself up short once in a while and say, everybody quit feeling so inadequate. It's not you anyway. You're not the big yet. God is the big yet. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of my thoughts, at least for today. Okay. My name is Christine, and I know that uh, when I got in church, when I got in church, it was because my son was sick. My sister was in church, and so what she did was said to bring my son to church to get prayer for him. So when I did that, I, I blew every son to take him to the church to get prayer for the Lord saving me. So I knew it was things that God wants me to do, things that God wanted to show me, but it was scary to me. I didn't know how to. Uh, I didn't know how to to just take hold of that, you know, and to let God use me. I saw it back away from it. So uh, my thing, my goal is to get to closer to God and to just uh, open myself up where he can use me. Because a lot of things come up and I sort of shy away. I back up instead of going forward because, like she said, it's not, it's not me, it's God. He's going to do it. He wants to use me and wants to show me things. And I just don't know how to just to take that in just, just yet, yeah. so I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay. Um, well, I, uh, my, my father was a uh, pastor, so I grew up in church, uh, and then uh, uh, decided that uh, when I was about 16 uh, that I had enough of that, and uh, went off and, and did my own thing for about the next 16 years. Uh, uh, came back uh, to the Lord when I was 32 years old as a result of a uh, family tragedy. And uh, uh, have, I mean, the Lord, uh, it was time, because the Lord saved me, delivered me, and filled me with the Holy Spirit all within the first week. Uh, and 
tried to walk in that ever since. Um, always uh, uh, went, to, went to Bible college. I've always known that uh, when I came back that uh, the Lord wanted to, to use me. Uh, and uh, I wasn't really sure how. Uh, and uh, uh, probably spent a, a number of years just, you know, uh, kind of waiting for his direction on, on what that ought to be. Uh, always had a great interest in, um, in counseling. I've read uh, uh, you know, uh, books about various people and, and uh, 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 had, that, had that interest. Always thought, you know, that may be the area that, that uh, God could really use me in. And uh, so when I got this opportunity, you know, when, when, and, and that's what this really is to me. It's, it's, this is like a, a God-given opportunity, you know. I'm not getting any younger. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Lord, we need, to, we need to get on with it here. And, and uh, so even though I'm pretty busy with lots of other things, I'm trying to take the, uh, uh, the time out to, to do these classes, to pursue it. I'd really like to uh, 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 become associated with a, with a, a counseling center of some kind and, and, uh, and do some serious counseling. Um, but the Lord is going to have to teach me some things first, and I understand that. <laughs> and I'm going to have to, uh, uh, I want to know that He's, he's the one who's, who's uh, leading me and discerning. So that I can only help people because I know that, that uh, it's all he that can, can change people. I'm here you really want to help people. That's why you're here. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share? Yeah. You don't have to. Yeah. Um, I've prayed and prayed for years. I've been Christian for 20 some years and thought I was, I wasn't raised Christian at all. Nothing when I was growing up. Total opposite. And so I became Christian and thought, well, this is what I do. I'm supposed to do this and this and pray and, and just I didn't have a lot of people teaching me what to do and how to do it, but I learned how to pray on my own. And um, um, then we had my son passed away nine years ago and I thought I was doing okay until he passed away and then I just was kind of thrown backwards and um, I took me two years to get out of that and I thought I'm out of this now and I'm, the Lord's going to help me and, and I'm going to do what he wants to do. This is what my life is and I'm going to do what he asked me to do. Not knowing that I still wasn't really out of grieving. And so my life was, uh, I thought I was doing what he wanted. And I could feel him and working in a, a Christian school and then working in a Christian daycare. And I just recently found out, oh, a month and a half ago, that all of these, it's taken me nine years to get through this. And I am finally through it. I am finally past the hurdle. And I have prayed and prayed that God would use me on a willing vessel. And he told me, that's all I wanted you to say, that you're a willing vessel. And so I've just given my life to him totally. And I've prayed Mondays and Tuesdays for two hours at the church with another friend. And it's just us. I have this music all through the church. And it's just, he just fills me full. And I am doing what he wants. And I'm not doing the works myself. And whatever he asks, since I said I'm a lone vessel, he said, I'm using you, I will use you. And he does daily with the children. And I see a difference in myself. I feel like a new person. And everything 
And my past life is my past life. And I am a new person in Christ because of him. And that's why I want to keep experiencing his will. That's, that's why I'm in this class. Because I just feel full of him. I have um, this zeal, this fire, whatever. And that's why I'm just What's so interesting here, remember, a very interesting group here, I think, because a lot of you have some very advanced concepts about God. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but that's good. We're at different places, and we can see how we sort of pull all those things together. Uh, let me share a little bit from the book just to get us started so you can be thinking about that. Uh, and the interesting thing about this book is what it's going to do is give you a method for moving to the next level, moving to the next step. And it goes through those, if you flip to the back of your book, okay, to the very back of your book, <clears throat> it goes through these different principles that they have come up with, and that's what we're going to be learning as we go through the book. Okay? The first one is God is always at work around you. See, sometimes what we've gotten this idea is, what has God called me to do? Like, we are the center of the universe, and God's supposed to accommodate us in some way. And he doesn't seem to work that way. That's what this book is trying to tell us to a certain degree. It says, even if we weren't here, would God still be working? No question. And when I was in the Air Force, it was very clear that if I died at any particular time, there would be another person in my shoes in about 10 seconds. <laughs> but maybe we're not so great in one of those we can. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. See, it's not us pursuing Him. It's Him pursuing us. And He's trying to get things through to us, but sometimes... Our heads are just a little bit too hard and a little bit too rocky. And so it takes some work and it takes time. God invites you to become involved with Him in His work. Notice it says invites. Many are called, few are chosen. You're the one that's got to decide if you really want to join His team and work with Him in His direction. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. We all have different ways, and when we get into those sections, we'll be really talking about hearing from God and really understanding. He talks to us, and one of the big questions I always ask, am I really sure this is God talking to me? Or was that me talking to me? And especially if it didn't turn out how I thought it should turn out. Was that God talking to me? Or was I the one who got myself into this particular situation? And we want to share a different way because people have different experiences there. God's invitation to work with Him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. So what this is going to suggest is that when you finally understand what the next step God wants us to take, it's going to make you step out of your nice little comfortable box and it's going to make you to do some things that you're going to have to decide whether you're willing to do them or not. Because yes. He's not going to make you do it, is He? Now number six, this is the one people like the least. You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what He is doing. Do you notice the difference? See, we so much get so focused and we say, well, I want to do something great for God. Well, what if that doesn't fit in with God's plan? Are you willing to just be the janitor in the church for God? Are you willing to step down from your high and lofty position and uh, do something totally different? But it might make you make major changes in your life. And that's when this group can get very interesting. You know, God might start speaking to people and say, you need to start doing this, or you need to go and start this, or you might, you need to start a support group. Wouldn't that be a scary, shocking thing to 
have to lead a support group all by yourself, right? As you get more experience. You come to know God by experience as you obey Him and He accomplishes His work through you. See, the bottom of the experience they're talking about here is not just experiencing His presence. It's not just talking about other things. It's talking about real life, meeting the road, rubber meets the road, real stuff. You really do it. It really happens. You really get results. It either works or it doesn't work. That's what this whole support group is about. And it might end up from this support group that some of you will find your specific call from God. It might come from this, you'll learn how to hear from God when you don't. The problem is we have to get real. And many times we can think we have something that we don't have. Remember this young man in my church when I first pioneered it and thought that everything he thought God had told him. But we're going to have to get clear that when God's talking, when the devil's talking, and when I'm talking, did I realize in my own life, one of the reasons for the courses that I'm teaching right now, is that I realized that I always thought I was walking according to the Spirit. But then I realized that practically I didn't even know for sure exactly what it was required to walk according to the Spirit. I thought it was ours. All it took is you simply trying to hear from God and do what God called you to do, right? Well, the question is, is that's all there is to it? I think there's a whole lot more to this subject. Another thing that the Lord has just shown me recently, a lot of has shown you too, is this whole idea that, see, I'm the type of person because that's where I work with my dad. He told me, go and do this. So I went and I did it, and I did something for my dad, right? And I always wanted to do something for God, right? Well, now all of a sudden I had this shocking experience of realizing he doesn't want me to do something for him. He wants to do it through me. He doesn't want me to go off and do my thing. He wants me to do it with me. And that's not the way I normally operate. I'm the type of guy that goes off to my cave and thinks it through, or I go and develop this, or figure out this, and go teach that, or go do that. But that's not the way he wants to work. Because, see, he's a little bit smarter than I am. I don't know where I get that idea. And one of the things that he sort of knows is that him doing the work of God is going to be a lot more effective than me trying to be like him, doing the work of God. And guess what that means? I've got to get out of the way. And that's part of my problem. Maybe I don't know exactly how to get out of the way. And if I don't know how to get out of the way, he's not going to be able to do it. But see, the potential just goes on and on and on. If I can get a hold of that, if I can just go around and say, okay, God, whatever you want today, just manifest yourself through me. And that's all that I want. I'm going to give up all my dreams, give up all my ideas, give up all my mountains I'm going to climb, give up all these other kind of things that I want to do. God, all I want you to do is manifest yourself through me. And that's what this book is that we're going to get into. <coughs> so I'm going to... Well, first, let's... Anyone else have anything else that you want to... I share any ideas that came to mind as we talked about this that you'd like to share more about yourself or about your goals or what you'd like to get out of this group. One of the things that, uh, that I was reminded of, and I, I get reminded of this several months in a while, but I was taken by the story of Joseph. You know, you recall how his brother sold him when he was in prison and, 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 you know, the whole story is very familiar. Well, there came a time when Joseph said to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And you know, we have all, uh, through our life's lifetimes, had years, maybe, if you're anything like me, had years when your life was really pretty pathetic. You know, you made a lot of mistakes, you made a lot of, a lot of wrong choices and everything. But when I moved to Wichita, uh, I got before the Lord, I just ground my face in the dirt and said, God, bring something good out of everything that I've experienced. Turn this around. I've taken that scripture, you know, that, that Joseph said to his brothers, Lord, I want that scripture to be mine. 
you know, this, my life was meant for evil, but I want to turn around. I want it meant for good. And that's how I can have a compassion for other people, because I know how hard life is and how easy it is to make mistakes and how easy it is to get off the track. And I want to be able to help people. And that's, that's the whole point of the whole thing, working with God, is to lead people and hopefully help them to not make the mistakes that, that I have made or perhaps that you have made. Yeah. So, that's, I just, mm -hmm. I, that just came to me again. I think the Lord has shown me recently that's really comforting. And that is, that every mess I've made in your life is useful. Absolutely. In fact, the more you've messed up, you know why you need to have made a lot of mess ups and screw up a lot of stuff in your life? Because that's how God convinces you that you can't do it. As long as you can succeed, as long as what you did has all worked, then you're really in trouble because you're going to rely on yourself and you're going to think you can do it. So I want you to think about it. all the worst messes, the most embarrassing things you can possibly imagine about your past and to think how wonderful that is because those are the things that taught you that you can't do it. That is how God was working in your life to die to yourself, to die to your self-reliance in your life. And so those are all good things. Romans 8, 28, and we know that everything, God works for the good, for them that love Him. See, are your mistakes part of everything? Yes, they are. That are willing to fit in with His plans. And so instead of looking at all that stuff and all the struggles, everything you messed up, just say, this is part of the learning curve. This is part of what it takes to experience God and to really die to yourself to the point that He can manifest Himself through you. That's right. Lord, we thank you for everybody in this group. I can see it's going to be a great and wonderful group, Lord. And I ask you to help them to really be dedicated to come every single time as, as much as all, at all possible and to really get into these books and to learn and to hear from you that we can all grow tremendously, Lord, in getting to know you and finding out your call for us and experience you in a real and substantial way. In Jesus' name.